Okay. Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Franco Romero. And your near-death experience was like day one of your life, wasn't it? Pretty much, yeah. It it uh, to unbeknownst to me, it happened very early in my life. Yes, that's right. So um, you can start wherever you like. Take as long as you like. Sure. Okay. Uh, you know, actually, I'd like to do something a little different okay. than sure. than the way than the way that I usually present my story uh, to others. Um, it just sort of been kind of inspired by our, our our conversation that we had just moments before. Yeah, we've we been talking for half hour. <laughs> we have been talking a little bit, even even talked about my choice of shirts, but we won't get into that right now, will we? <laughs> so, um, are you saying you want me to stay here with you and not like leave you on speaker because I don't care? <laughs> no, you're, this is good. This is good. Okay. Um, so. Normally, I, I go in right into my near-death experience, but I actually would like to actually share a little bit of how all of this sort of happened in terms of how I became aware of it. And for some people, it's going to be a little bit hard maybe to chew on because my near-death experience happened when I was six months old. And right there, people often just... Okay, kind of, I thought it was a birth. I'm wrong on that then. No, okay. but you know what? Birth, six months, it's pretty much for okay. at that age, you just, everything seems the same, you know? So, um, so for me, I didn't know that I died at, at that age. Um, I wasn't told anything throughout my early years, my youth and, and my teenage years, but my life was really full of very strange events uh, that probably started giving it away pretty early. So from the time that I was, I'd say about seven till I was about 15, I lived in what I call the hauntings because paranormal experiences for, for me in my life were, were pretty normal. Okay. Um, I didn't know any differently. And, but that experience of having that, and it was pretty intense at times, um, really gave me a chance to, to see a different aspect of what reality might be all about are you saying uh, you saw ghosts oh yes yes ghosts there there was um well some would call and i i'm careful about this because i have a slightly different interpretation now than i did back then um but it was very demonic um it, there were some subtle possessions uh in my family um there was an exorcism um, and so, you know, th this was kind of like back in the day, it was like, I always describe it as the exorcist versus meets the omen meets and, and uh, you know, all these other uh, movies that were out at the time that really. Are you kind saying like a priest come to your house to try to yes. kind of cleanse it? Yeah. Yeah. So we, 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 it was, a you know, it's one of those things where when you go to a movie, um, you watch this and you go, you know, why are you still there? You know, get out of the house kind of a thing. But, you know, mm -hmm. for me, I was seven, eight years old. I had, I didn't have much of a say in any of that. And so your whole family was going through this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But in that time period, um, one of the things that came out of that was, is that I developed a, a closer relationship with this inner voice that I later on in life, grew to understand and know it as, as a collective consciousness through my clairvoyance. Um, at the time, it was just for me kind of like having a, an imaginary friend, but not really having an imaginary friend. For me, it was real. I'm and assuming this is a good spirit. Extraordinarily good spirit, yes. Um, it was really more of a they. I never really felt it was just one spirit. It was just like, like a collective of just feeling that I was always protected by by a kind of a group of, of beings that often when I would go to bed at night and it wasn't just at night when we had these experiences but when I would go to bed at night they would literally I felt like they were always there kind of tucking me in and ensure and, and encouraging me or it's or letting me know that I was okay that my they always used to say don't worry they they won't hurt you um, your light shines too brightly. That was all they would say to me. And I, I completely understood it. And it was completely, for me, it was like, that's all I needed to hear. And I would go to bed and that would be it. Um, 
so that experience went on for for five years and um and as i said that that allowed me to have this relationship with this voice but as i got into my early teenage years that relationship kind of went away just because as with everything um you just move on you kind of just start thinking that those those voices were just in your imagination and and you just start becoming a teenager um but by the time i was in my mid teens <clears throat> the struggles I was having to connect with, with my life and the world, not just because of the hauntings, but just in general, I just felt disconnected with everything. Uh, we're getting really, really intense. Um, I remember going to bed many, many nights crying and praying and asking, you know, for clarity because I just didn't know where to turn. There were just no places like today. Were you there hearing these voices? Um, Not at that there? point. By that by that point, I had cut off. Let's just say I had cut off my communications with them. I started just I wrote them off as just just, you know, an imaginative friend or something. People were telling me indirectly that this is just part of what you have as a little boy. You know, your your imagination runs amok and you create imaginary voices and friends. And so I just chalked it off as just something that I I had okay, so you cut them off so where was your dilemma then like my dilemma was is that I knew that there was something more going on in my life that was that these paranormal experiences and just these general general feelings I was having like this life doesn't make sense I don't feel like I fit in I don't but it wasn't like I didn't fit into what was the norm I felt that there was a different norm and that everything else didn't make sense to me and at 15 always on the outside looking in always on the outside looking in me too. except that on the outside it was absolutely clear to me what the outside felt like yeah. the outside was perfect it was beautiful it was so it, it made sense to me it felt like like home uh which is the way that i hear a lot of people describe it when when i talk to students or others who i can who i coach with they they describe home and I really ask them to really help flesh that out because to them, home was a place where they, where everything did make sense to them, that they felt that they were much more than just this person that was being told you're pretty much insignificant and worthless in life. And that you had to fit into a norm of something that didn't to, to any of us make, make sense. The, the inconsistencies of the way we treated each other and the way that we were told to view ourselves just never made sense to us. Not in the home that, that we remember uh, another place, another dimension, another time. So for me, those things didn't necessarily articulate that well. I mean, they, I was 15. I was just struggling. I didn't know if it was because of, you know, being 15 and, and just getting through puberty and all of that stuff, or, or was there something more? And to me, there was always this something more. And I wasn't a very uh, devout anything at that time. My, my mother was a tremendously devout Catholic and my dad wasn't, uh, he, he wasn't atheist or anything. He just wasn't, he just didn't do anything. And for me, it, it was there was really nowhere that I could really turn to at the time. Um, if I tried to talk to somebody about this, um, typically what would happen because I had had some experience with this with a with with a sibling is that if you talk about this, you start to be evaluated. Are you somehow mentally confused or? Do you have some sort of spiritual dilemma? Are you are you possessed? Is there something going on given the past history of your of your family? So I kind of kept quiet about a, a lot of that for a long time. And um, one night when it got really, 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 really bad, I um, I remember going to bed and I was crying and I asked for clarity about just why do I feel this way? How do I even keep going if I don't understand how my life relates to this whole world? And it was in that night that, and this actually became a pretty a pretty constant theme throughout my life in terms of the way that I use my clairvoyance. Yeah, um, is that's that important, isn't it? Ask. What's that? Ask that word. Yes, asking. Ask. Yes, it's asking and, and asking from a, a real pure place, you know, um, is also where, where it wasn't 
so much about fear it was just genuine asking. It was just, please give me clarity. And um, that that night was the beginning of of many nights where I began to have a series of of dreams and especially. I, I call them dreams and then there were visions and the visions occurred a lot just in the morning time as I was kind of getting out of the sleep state and I was very lucid and I would just lay there in bed and I away I went. I mean, it was just like these things would come up and I would just go with them. And what I was sh being shown was an event in, in, in my life, although I didn't know it the first couple, you know, the, for the first couple of minutes or in, into the dream, I didn't realize that I was having a remembrance, I call it, of an event that happened way at the beginning, way before I could remember anything, at least not these kind of events, of a child that was in a hospital. And this begins the the NDE portion of it. So in essence, I was having throughout my early years, I was having all these series of STEs, these spiritually transformative experiences. I then I guess in a sense were preparing me to help me to see what I was about to see in my teenage years, which was that I was in the hospital. I was, I was, I remember being in the hospital and I was in a room with my mother and my mother was younger. Um, I remember right away, I, I was thinking, well, she looks beautiful. I mean, not that she didn't at the time that I was a teenager, but she looks so much younger. And I had my aunt there and there were some ladies there that I didn't recognize and there were doctors there and, and they were all, their attention was on this little baby in this incubator and, um, and that baby was struggling. Um, at the time I didn't really know why, but I knew that, that there was something going on with, with that baby and it wasn't looking good. And one of the doctors, uh, there were a couple of doctors that came in and out, a couple of nurses that were coming in and out. Nobody recognized me. I I was just kind of sitting there as the observer. And I remember being really tied to my to my mom. Um, I could feel all the energy. And that was the other, you know, these were little subtle things that I was picking up that were really odd in my dream because they weren't they weren't the same in other dreams. I could feel the energy in the room. I, I could feel the shifting, and it was all based on emotion. The, you know, I could sense how people were reacting and what they were in their thoughts without having to necessarily hear them come out of their mouth. Um, but when I, my, my mom was the one that I was most attached to, and I remember she was sitting on the bed near the incubator, and I remember kind of sitting behind her and just kind of observing and hearing what she was what she was going through in her mind. And when the doctor came in, uh, and pulled her out to tell her what was going on. Um, they they basically said that my my functions, my bodily functions, were my organs were shutting down. That they this was kind of progressing pretty quickly. What my mom had taken me in for, she told me later, was that I was going in. She I had had a couple of days where I was struggling getting over what she thought was just like kind of kind of cold or flu symptoms, and um, so she brought brought me in um, to just get checked out and they decided to keep me in the hospital because they thought I had some I had pneumonia and it was progressing pretty quickly and and so um so that situation just got bad fast it got bad really really fast and to the point that when when the doctor came in at that point he he told her that it was likely that I was going to die before the, before the end of the night that I really only had maybe a couple hours to live. Everything was going so fast. They didn't know what to do at that point. Um, they asked if she could, or they would want the priest to come in and, and be with them and pray, pray with them and, and um, do my last rites. And at that point, I remember, I remember that for her, everything became very disconnected. She, she wasn't there. She was there physically, but I could sense her energy had just shifted completely. Like she had totally zoned out of the whole conversation she was having with the doctor. And it was almost like she had gone into some sort of hypnotic state. She literally listened. And then when it was done, she went in back into, into the room, grabbed her things and left the hospital, which you would think at that point, you know, given the circumstances, you would probably stay there and and be with your child for a couple of hours while you still could but she didn't she felt compelled to leave the hospital there was a church not too far away from there and I remember that when she got 
close to the church. It was kind of on a little tiny boulevard. And when she got to the church, uh, about a half a block to a block away, she got on her knees and she was already in such a state of prayer that she, she got on her knees and she crawled into the hospital, up the steps, it, all the way up to the altar and began to, as, as I described it in the book that I wrote, um, it was like as if she was in a, in a real big trance, like a deep, deep trance. Um, she later on, when we talked about this, because when I confronted her later on this, she gave she gave me a few other things that 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 happened. But but she she remembers it being like she was completely out of body, and um, and we sat there. I meaning her. She sat there in the altar by the altar, and I just sat next to her, and she was praying. But the prayer that she had was different. It was it created a different energy in, in the church. It was a prayer of gratitude. It was a prayer of appreciation. She was so grateful to God for having given her the chance to experience me, even if it was just for six months. And I remember when I sat there, it was so, <laughs> Oh my God, I'm it, crying. That's so it, sad. it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was beautiful. It was like yeah. I remember sitting there and I was so touched by her prayer because it wasn't this prayer of of of, of a subjug subjug subjugation. It wasn't like please, 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 you know. It was more like thank you, thank you for for this time. If it's time for him to go, then then thank you for having given me that chance. Love. Yeah, right. And um and I remember that at that moment when she finished that everything for me that I remember so clearly was how the energy kept changing in all of this. Um, the room became extraordinarily, extraordinarily lighter. It became, there was so much peace that was surrounding her and, and, and this sort of sense of love that was surrounding everything. And she saw a vision. Um, she was given a vision in, in, in the time that she was praying and she saw what my life was going to be like when I was older. She saw me growing up to be the man that she had hoped I would be, the father, the you know, the husband, the the the, the son. And she was so grateful for that opportunity to see that. It, she 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 told me that she she didn't even know where that came from, but to have had that vision, it, it gave her that that final closure for her to know that everything was fine, that regardless of what she was going back to at the hospital, she got a chance to see something that she might never have been, never would be able to experience, but it was to her enough to know that it was time to, to just let go and surrender to it. And so, um, so when that finished, she got up and she went back to the church and she, I mean, she went back to the hospital and she expected she expected the worst. I mean, she was expecting her her family to be out there waiting to tell her the news. And they were. And they were crying. But they were crying out of joy. They were astonished at the fact that when she was gone, she left me pretty much dead. And when she came back, everything had started to come back to normal. My vitals were coming back and my organs were starting to 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 open up again and the doctors well back then even till today they'll sometimes they'll still do this but back then when they didn't understand any of that kind of stuff they would just especially where i was at because this was in south america um they just chalked it up as a miracle and and they went on they just left it at that we don't know we don't know exactly what happened but through the grace of god it it was a miracle and that was it and the next day or the next two days i believe i was still in the hospital for another day or so and then i, I came home and within a couple of months my family was on a plane to to live in the u.s and which is where i've been all my life since then um the other part of this was another vision or, or series of dreams that i had that actually showed me what had happened during the time that she was in the church and that part of it is more of what you commonly hear about how 
I, I for me it was a little maybe a little different i don't know i i have i don't compare and contrast too much but i i was in the desert why i don't know okay i just was in the desert and it would it went for it went for miles in every direction and when i was there i was surrounded by a couple of people and they were there was an older gentleman very very old gentleman and a very very young boy and they were both very decrepit and they didn't really speak they just kind of mumbled words they were um they were looking up at what i thought was me um but i realized that they had their hands out as if they were begging for something and when i looked at it more carefully i realized they weren't looking at me they were looking through me and i looked up and above me was this beautiful orb that looked like like the sun except it was probably about 10 times bigger than the sun and i remember thinking right away it's like i'm not i'm not scorching hot i'm in the desert i'm not scorching hot and my eyes uh were not blinded by the light it was actually really soothing and soft and i could stare at that light forever and as that light kept getting closer and closer i realized that my body was actually starting it started out as a, as a tingle and then it became more of a massive vibration i felt my body just shaking um but it was a good shake i felt it it was really weird because the way that i try to describe it to people it's still hard to even give do it justice what i felt was every single cell in my body was, was vibrating in a way that it was responding to that light it was as if it was they were i do give those cells consciousness because of some because the moment that that happened i actually viewed myself and this is really kind of odd i still when i when i remember back to this it, it's it's hard to capture the experience but i viewed myself as each and every one of those cells i saw and felt the vibration as if I were like 50 trillion of me, you know, because that's what we basically have in our bodies. I felt it. I felt like I could look around and I could see myself in 50 trillion aspects of me looking back at me and experiencing this. And when the light finally sort of consumed me, I could see that what it was was a collection, a collective of just infinite number of beings. I mean, everywhere. They were everywhere and i remember that in that whole mass uh, of spirituality there were these this handful of beings that that stood out and the interesting thing was that every one of those beings and i remember looking around and i could see even the little tiniest being way up there like if you were at a stadium and you could see that little tiny person way up at the corner you know those seats and i knew them I mean, I, I I knew them and they knew me. Like it wasn't like anybody was foreign to me at all. Every single one of those beings, I had had some kind of a relationship, a history with them, and I knew them. They were all family to me. Um, but it wasn't to me like family like here. It was like family from like so many different places, so many different times, so many different dimensions, so many different worlds. But we all knew each other. And these in particular, these three or four beings came up to me and they didn't have facial expression. They didn't have facial characteristics. I, they, they were really silhouettes. And, and yet I knew them. I knew that they were like my closest, my closest family. And they surrounded me. They talked to me, but they didn't talk to me audibly. They, it was all telepathic. I could feel them is the best way to describe it. Um, I knew everything about them. They knew everything about me. They were so happy for me to be there. And if I, I tell people if I had had arms, which maybe I did, but I don't know. I didn't really view my body that way at that point. Um, we all hugged each other. And at that moment, it was like, a, if, if I wasn't already feeling this massive explosion of, of euphoria, of rapture, of whatever you want to call it, at that moment, I blew up. I just, I just blew up. I mean, I became like one with everything. It was like I, all of a sudden my circuitry came back and I was connected to every single individual being in that light. Um, and 
I call it in, in the book, I call it my million hugs, but that doesn't even do it justice because it was way more than that. I didn't want to leave at that point. And I just stayed in that present moment as long as I could, but I could feel that there was this entity around me. And even though it wasn't really saying much to me, I could feel that it was sort of like standing near me, waiting for me to get my hugs out of the way. And as soon as that happened and I felt the sense of like, okay, I'm here to stay um, and I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, they grabbed me um, by the shoulder and I got whisked out of that scene, if you will. And I went back through the proverbial tunnel of lights that, that I had probably come through. And even though it didn't seem that way when I was doing it from the front end, and, um, and all of a sudden, I literally landed on my bed again. And when I did, I remember opening up my eyes. I was confused, like, because this felt enormously real. It was so real that I began to cry because I didn't want to be back here again. I knew that where I was was my home and that that was more true to me than anything, anything that I had experienced up until that time. And really, quite honestly, anything that I've experienced since, um, that was more home to me. Um, that began, like I said, a series of these events until I finally couldn't handle it anymore. I had to talk to somebody. So I told my mom. These events, you refer to them as memories? like the, As I memories, memories yeah. Of this yes. stuff that happened. And yes, it, it, it went on quite a bit for quite some time. And um, I... It was it was becoming really hard for me not to want to share this with somebody because for one thing, I mean, it was really to me, it was at a point where I needed it badly. I needed to see who I really was. And um, I didn't know that that's what I was asking for. I was just asking for some clarity. I didn't think that I was going to be shot out of a cannon and into this whole setting of what had happened to me. 15 but have years. answers. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know? and and so given what we had gone through in our earlier history as a family in terms of the hauntings i was afraid to share it with anybody but i needed to and back then there just were the support systems that there are today um you couldn't get on any kind of a youtube because there was no youtube or, or internet or any social media to or, talk or book what would you call it you know nothing. what do you look up what do you right? look up there was nothing there was nothing uh, i you know so in one on one hand i was enormously at peace, but also enormously confused, even more so now, because I didn't really now I everything began to make sense. But the more it began to make sense from a, from let's call it a spiritual perspective, it was no longer making more sense to me in terms of this. I didn't have a way to decipher and filter it so that I could make sense of this reality. Um, so I went to my mom because she was in my dream. She was, it was, I figured she must know something. And, and they, I remember being in the kitchen and I said, look, I really need to talk to you because this, this is really, really, really bothering me. And she knew already. I mean, she was, she was very concerned because she had seen all these transformations going on with me. Um, and I told her the story and I remember to this day how her mouth just dropped when I told her about the events in the hospital, because it was one thing to maybe, you know, just share the events of the hospital and, and somehow some way I might have heard about it from someone, but she had never told me anything. Nobody told me anything. It's another thing that I, I remember going back and telling her her exact prayer um, in, in the church and, and what she did and how she did it and all these things that nobody knew. And she, she looked at me and since we had had some interesting experiences already in the past she kind of looked beyond that and she i remember her telling me she goes you know this was a that, that's a miracle i mean just not just the events that happened that night but this in itself is a miracle and you should share this with people and i'm going and i'm thinking i'm 15 years old who the, who am i going to share this with <laughs> you know i just want to know was this did this really happen or why am i dreaming about this and she told me she said everything that you remember is exactly, exactly the way it happened. Even the prayers and even the thoughts she had and the emotions she was, and the visions she had, she said, everything was exactly the same. But I didn't share with anybody else after that. I kept it to myself. 
and that because we're not crazy right we don't yeah we're not we're not crazy but we're we're not crazy peggy but we're we're afraid to be labeled that because we have no again no way to substantiate that we have nobody to talk to about it there's no book there's nothing so i just kept quiet and i actually i kept really quiet i shoved it under the rug i i um lived what i tried to live was a normal life i went back to i really tried at that point in my life to try to revisit my my faith my 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 catholic faith i'm sorry i'm just having a moment it's just like how much, you know, what percentage of our lives do we spend trying to be normal? What a you waste. Know, that, that's, that's the thing, right? That's why I said this. This is why I use this, right? Because because there, this reality, the definition of normal is insanity. In my, yeah. and, so, yeah. and so to try to adjust to that insanity is insanity in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And we don't see that. Uh, not right away and some of us do in our awakening to to this whole question of who are we but that's the that's the dilemma we all face and then you told you throw on top of that this supernatural experience that i was going through and then the fact that that was tied to an nde it really started for me to just it it, like i said it was peaceful in some ways but also it began to just to really quite make me question this whole entire reality i mean it just i couldn't tuck that away i mean i tried under the rug and i tried to live that normal life we i got married i started having children and we were starting to teach them about things about the bible and stuff but there was this thing that just kept telling me yeah there are there are some really great things to be shared in in stories about the bible but there's so much more richness that that is being left out and and why and and you know what's the purpose of of leaving it out and what could happen if it was actually added back in and all these things were flitting through my head and so i felt i i felt like i could deal with it and so i went through my 20s and early 30s or mid 30s and this just kept getting getting worse and worse and worse i was feeling this urge to go back home and and i do a lot of coaching with people and one of the triggers that i that i know when somebody has really had an intense either nde or or st um, is when they start talking about wanting to go home and and that to me is when I know, like for me, it was wanting to be back there. It was wanting to be back where I knew I belong, where I'm always at. But this thing here was becoming more and more an illusion to me, like a big dream to me. And I wanted to wake up. And so by the time I was in my late 30s or so, um, I was starting to have a couple of STE experiences that they really kind of drove it home. It was as if every time I tried to tuck it under the rug and every time I tried to live this normal life that everybody was saying, you know, you had to live this way of life, um, I would always be reminded, no, 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 <laughs> no, you're not. And you, that's not you didn't go through all of this in your early life just so you could just tuck it under the rug. There was there were more ST events. I, I talk about them in in the book quite a bit. Um that just made me really have to revisit this question of, is this, is this really real? I mean, is this some sort of a, a, a an experience for me to, to, to understand myself in a different way? And I want to be that abstract about it because back then that's all the, I could be, I was, I wasn't, I wasn't versed in anything. I didn't really have this profound knowledge of of anything other than my experiences that i had yeah it's like but we're living in two worlds we're exactly living in two worlds in fact there was a gift that was given to me by a friend for no apparent reason uh, but he just thought he saw it and he thought i would like it and it was this book called something about a, a traveler in two worlds or something like that and i looked at it i never read it but i looked <laughs> at the cover and I couldn't help but stare at it and go, why does this feel like me? Why do I feel like I'm a traveler in two worlds? Like, like 
I'm trying to balance something between this world that I supposedly live in physically and this other world that I know I am spiritually beyond all of this. And and it, it, it was a heavy balance, but it's one that I realized would bring me ultimately in the, later on in life, it would bring me peace as soon as, as I started to understand more and more. And I, by that point, by my early forties, mid forties, I had had an awakening, one of these powerful experiences where, where, um, I was, I was putting my kids to bed. I was at that point, so distraught. I, that I was going through a massive depression. I, this depression wasn't just a week old. It was months. It was really years old. What I, age I was, did you say? I was probably around my early to mid forties by that point. Okay. Um, and I just was, I knew I was, I was living a lie. I, I knew that there, that I couldn't live this life that everybody wanted me to live. You know, you get tired, uh, don't you? It's tired exhausting. To, it, it's tired exhausting. To fit in like a, I say it's like that, um, square peg trying to fit in a round hole. Yeah. You and you're for, and you're forcing it though. You're forcing, you're, you're, you're squeezing that peg in as much as you can. And it, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting to, to live. And I do want to, I use my words very, 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 very carefully, but there's no other way to describe it other than I was feeling like I was living a lie to myself, yeah. not to anybody else. I mean, to, yeah, that, try to please everybody else and to heck with us. Exactly. And we can never please anybody. This person wants this, but the other one's the opposite. And you're constantly trying to, and then finally, like, where's me? What do I think? Exactly. And and the reason, you know, it's interesting because I, I really haven't gone into this much detail about my story because, well, first of all, I mean, yeah, I wrote it in the book. I, I, I tell people that the first half of my book is about my about what we're talking about here, about how I took all of these events in my life, shared the events and, and took them and tried to make sense of them in, in some way that that didn't make sense. Looking back at it, I was using tools to make sense of it that were very primitive because to me they were they were tools that even I realized were were set within the context of how I was supposed to handle it, and and it just wasn't working. Um, there was something much greater. Yeah. And, like the soul was trying to communicate through this brain. Yes, exactly. And and none of these so called social tools uh, were going to do anything for me. And, and so I tell people that the, the first half of the book um, is really a manual on how not to do things, um, because unless you really want to go through the trials and tribulations that that I went through, and, and there have been people who have gone through worse, but for me, it didn't matter. That was my trial and that was my tribulation. But if you want to go through it all, by all means, go through it all. But if you want to glean some ways of maybe viewing your your awakening, whatever you want to call your transformation, whatever it is, then here's a way that I went through it. And oh, by the way, try not to do it this way because we get pushed I pushed into identity crisis, don't we? It was yeah, I called it a spiritual crisis, but it wasn't because to me, who we are, spirit is your true identity. So yes, it is an identity crisis, a, a massive one. I mean, a, a real massive one. And I also share this because because I know that because of the emails that I have gotten and the students that I work with because of all this, they tell me about, you know, how their lives have been and they need, you know, as much as, as much as we both know, you and I were talking about this a little bit. We, as much as, as much as we know that people come and visit these, these types of channels for all sorts of reasons, there are those who are coming to these channels who want to remember something. They're trying to remember, they're trying to get clues, anything that might help them understand why they're going through the suffering that they're going through, or why is it that they feel these remembrances of something far away yeah. from this world? Those moments where we stop in our tracks and say, why does this feel familiar? Yes, exactly. And there, I will tell you, there are so many people more more than we give credit to that are doing that are tuning into this kind of a discussion because they need clarity the way that we saw clarity the way i saw clarity years ago they need it because their life literally depends on it now 
they're going through some real serious crises that are really spilling into all of their lives. They're going through mental health issues. I talk a lot about mental health and about depression and about autism. And I talk about it, uh, you know, which you would think that, you know, autism, mental health, you know, okay, I can see the connection, but for me, everything's about frequency and, and, and consciousness now. And I can see it now from that perspective. And, and I try to get people to relate to it in a way that makes them realize that those those the, those crises that you're going through are, are actually a, a beautiful, I know this is going to sound weird, but a beautiful reminder that there's something deeper about you that is trying to to wake you up or to be awakened. And, and, and if you could see then that you're actually, the reason you're vibing and depressed is because you're vibing at a higher level of consciousness that's trying to cope with this heavier, lesser dense, I mean, more dense consciousness. And it's not working. And we're trying to fit that into here. Like, remember you were talking about square, the square peg in a round hole. We're trying to, we're trying to link that square peg into this, this round hole when it shouldn't have to be that way. If anything, it should be the round hole should be trying to get into that square peg. Yeah. And to give a visual on um, picture, like there's these invisible highways and we can get down on this dark, crappy road and stay there. Or we can try to move up on this gentle or breezy sunshine yeah. flowing and we and, and, high bay. Cause you I know, Peggy, feel you myself know, drop down sometimes. Oh, I'm absolutely. Like, oh, I got to get back up there. I don't want to be here. Yeah. Especially because when you start, when you start, and I call it vibing because it's all vibrational frequency. And when you start vibing at a higher level of awareness, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, it's it's impossible, impossible for you to go back down to it and stay there. Like you were just saying, you might dip down there, but when you dip down there, you become really sensitive to that space that you just dipped down into, and you realize uh, 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 I'm I'm floating back up. I can't I can't be there anymore. And that's I where have, the I have a hard time when a show's over. I, I'm down. You know, I'm, I get my energy built up because we're talking about this stuff and like you're connecting through your soul and stuff. And then it's over and I got to do dishes. I got to do laundry. I got to go out here and sweep this floor. It's, it's a big shift. It, it, it's a good perspective for what people were, what we're saying. You know, it's funny. It's funny you say that because up, about, a, up, about a year ago or so, I was, I was in, a, in that, in that sort of up and downness that you're talking about. It, it was probably more like just around COVID, like the early part of the COVID period. And um, people would ask me, how do you do it? And I said, what do you mean? And, and they'd say, well, how do you go from one moment connecting to this higherness of consciousness that you go through and you start to see, you know, prophetic things, visions of this, that, whatnot. And, and, and then all of a sudden just shut that down. And then go off and start doing your your work, your literal my literal work, which was at that time and still is to some extent a nutrition company that I own, and and I'd be like all of a sudden handling invoices and and statements and all these things, and, and myself included, I would be going, wait a minute. I told my wife this because somebody had mentioned this, and I said, you know, it is kind of funny, not in necessarily a good way, um, that I'm like going, I'll sit there and I'm going, I just. I just had this, what we would call downloads or channel, and I'm being shown all of this stuff that I would need to either write, I'm writing my second book. And, and it's so macro. It's so like, okay, here's exactly why this is all happening. This is what's going to happen to humanity. And then, okay, it's all done. Time to now. You know, yeah. And I'm all of a sudden now handling customer service calls from my company and stuff. And I'm going, you know, why did my shipment not get here? And like five minutes earlier, I'm having this global macro connection with, with God. And I'm going, it does get a little strange. It gets, you know, that's that two world thing happening. Um, since then, I've learned how to remember to make that transition so much gentler with myself. I don't even really make it. Um, I don't really even make the transition. You know, there's this phrase and you're probably familiar with it because uh, it's, it's a biblical one. If it, somewhere along there, um, there's the term being in this world, but not of it. 
And that phrase always has been something that has driven me since I was a little boy. I didn't understand what it meant, but something deep inside of me knew that that would have relevance to me later on in life. And now I understand it. And that is treating this world, being in this world in, in a physical sense, but, but viewing it in a much higher spiritual sense so that you're not, you're, you're in it, but yeah. you're not, you're not. It's, it's, I'm getting this visual of like a child. They're busy playing this imaginary and they got their tent and they made these men or whatever. And they're having this story playing out. And the mom comes in and says, clean your room. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> Clean your room. Get in the shower. I believe this land of I just created. I was exactly, exactly. And, <laughs> yeah. I'm make my bed and pick up my and, and clothes. <laughs> I think that's a great metaphor for the way that we that we are being challenged, and I really do see this as a school. The way that I there's a a section in in the book towards the end that talks about the awakening itself, and it talks about how we're in the school to remember, not not to learn, because we we already know everything. When when one passes and you get connected to to the oneness, you know everything. It's it's a given. But it's more about remembering. It's about being able to take what you are experiencing here, this world of contrast, and, and being able to to weave your way through the remembering process so that you can grow as, as, as a spiritual being, as, as part of God or as God, you just grow. That's what it's all about. And, and it, it, you know, I get into when that, when that happens, I get these downloads of other past schools and, and how that all works and not just here on this planet, but other planets. And it's, it's such a beautiful story of uh, i call it a dance it's a beautiful dance that we're going through and learning that dance and learning how to be both both the follower and, and the lead which is always a struggle for men and women you know that who leads who stru- who follows and and learning it from that perspective and and then all of a sudden you know then taking then all of a sudden being snapped into this diversion I don't call it reality. This this is an illusory reality. It's a game, and and just being woken up to it and going, okay, all right. So the challenge here is, how do I be in this world, but not of it? How do I get yeah. beyond this to 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 I... get to get to that point of of it's if it's a school of, of realizing who I am within within this within this world that tells you from the moment you're born that you are not any of that. Yeah, that it's you're... like when we're children, you know, we're in this imagination where these open hearts that just love and don't know yet how much love can hurt. And we live in this state and then, you know, we go to school, you got to sit and be quiet and yeah, you got homework and then you got to sports and you got whatever all the, and then work, life tells you you got to do this and that. And it's like, we forget that set our soul free let my soul sing part of our human existence we push it aside and i think as in the ears when we have these memories and and these stes we can't help but get back to that part of us i don't want to say child of us because that makes it nope. sound inferior and immature that's funny that you said that peggy I, I don't mean to interrupt but you just hit something that's a core of everything so, so, so in, for me, at least it's the core uh, when there's a chapter. I remember when I wrote this book, I was, I did this in, in a state of channeling because I'm not a writer. Okay. I don't, at the time that I was told to write this book, I wasn't like, oh, I've got outlines of this book and all. I was like, not writing a book was like the last thing on my wish list to do. Okay. It wasn't even on my wish list. Okay. So the events or the downloads that I would get and the things that I wrote, I just wrote them. And one chapter that I wrote, I remember my, my wife would say, you know, what are you going to write today? And I said, I don't know. You know, I'm being told to go in the room and start, you know, writing. Yeah. And I and I remember that I was um, sitting there in front of my laptop and I said, OK, I got into like a real quiet stay. And I said, let's go. Let's do it. You know, and they said this chapter is going to be called the inner child. And I go okay <laughs> inner child start typing it away and then i started 
just listening to what they wanted me to say. And I started typing away and I'm going, this is beautiful. This is like amazing. And it, at that point, I realized there was something, a, a message, a certain way of viewing the world that had been lost. And, and, that, and that view was to see the world through an omnipotent presence of God that views itself as as a child at, at this innocence and wonderment um, because if, if you recall like when you go into that light those elements the peace the love the joy this essence of freedom the the innocence the wonder it's all mixed into this ball of energy that makes you just go and explode that essence is what was has been lost in in a large extent over time and in fact that essence was not just lost but viewed to your point it was viewed as if it were something insignificant or or, or not worthy of being discussed which was how do you become again this omnipotent presence of of love and innocence and wonderment and so I'm just typing away, typing away. I'm going, it, I was like, this is incredible. And so it turns out later on in other channeling that I, I did um, that this reference of the child, of the power of the child uh, is actually written and sprinkled in so many sacred documents all over the world in so many different types of traditions. The Buddhists have references to, to, the, to the child, the power of the child of entering into the unknown space which the unknown space is is the space of silence and godliness. The Hindus have it. The Christians have it. Yeshua says something to the effect of that one cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless they receive it as a child. And though it sounded flowery, it sounded beautiful, it sounded like, oh, isn't that nice? There was real meaning to that. And so what I teach in in the coaching that I do with people is I teach this thing called the way of the inner child is to get them back to remembering that part of who you are is this essence of divinity is that you are a child, that there is power to that, an enormous amount of power to that. And if you can embrace that again, which in this world is looked at in not a very good way, stop talking to yourself, stop imagining, stop this, stop that, stop being innocent, Blah, 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 blah. But that's all part of how you have to weave your way through this world to figure your to remember yourself again is to get through all of that challenge to remember that part of you has this enormous amount of childish love, unconditional. And and perfection is what a child sees. It doesn't see any flaws in anything. That's God. And so I'm writing this chapter on I'm going, ah. Oh, and later on in, in life, they said, you will teach this. This is part of what you will teach, and others will teach this as well. This is part of what what humanity has to remember about itself again. I just, so I had to stop you there because it yeah, was such a big, big deal. Life and work and getting the better car, the better house, the bigger paycheck. There's, I mean, we're going to be dead. And I just feel like, you know, on the other side, like, wow, did I miss the boat? Did right. I and that always happens. Time. That that always happens. You talk to, you know, most near deafers and, and you talk to people who didn't die, but are on the edge of die, dying. And that is what they always say. Always say that what I really, really should have been paying attention to. I totally missed. And that's what we're trying to do here now. See, I, I have I have a. Uh, I, I talk to a lot of near death experiencers, not necessarily just students, but others. And I talk to ST ears. And when we get into really into the weeds of things, when we get really into the weeds, it wasn't about just their experience. It wasn't about, you know, the, the, the amazingness of that experience. But what it was, was that there were little subtleties in, in that experience that they were supposed to remember, to bring back. It wasn't just to bring back the story of how they experienced God or how they experienced Yeshua or anybody else over on the other side. It wasn't just that, even though that's what most people want to hear. But what, what was really, really in their weeds of, of what they wanted to come back with was who, who are we? Why are we here? What is the purpose of why we're doing this? And a little bit we talked about before we got started is, I'll be honest, 
the audience, most of them don't want to hear about that. They yeah. want to hear the experience. They want to see and know what heaven's like. They want to know where they're going, even though all these experiences are different for every individual and different parts in their life. But we as in the ears, we want to talk about this. That's what we're. Yeah. And, and we do. And, and, and we I, matter. and we do. What's, what's reassuring to me is that I, I get a lot of emails from people a lot and it's so beautiful to hear their stories because deep down inside the ones who reach out and there are many that don't, but the ones who reach out and want to pursue this more, they're feeling that they, they, they themselves will tell me that they didn't even know really why they were watching these NDE shows. They, but they, when we spoke, like you and I are speaking right now, something hit them, something that remember I was telling you that a lot of people will just watch these shows and and yes, they feel like they're being entertained by them. And yes, they're feeling like reassurance of what, what might be on the other side or what have you. But something finally triggered in them. And they said, OMG, wait a minute. This is me. You're telling my story. Even though it's different circumstances, mm -hmm. you're telling my story. And it just sets off a chain of events. It's like the dominoes start to fall. And they're just like on the computer and they like, oh, we need, I need to talk to you about this because I really never really viewed it this way. But now I see it. Yes, most people are there for reasons that are a little bit more, let's just say, superficial, just a little bit. But there's something about why they're being pulled in this direction that they themselves don't even know until they hear a conversation like the one we're having. And we could have heaven on earth. Yes. If everybody would let go. Yes. And let people be who they want to be. As long as they're not hurting others, be who you feel you're here to be. Exactly. And 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 you just hit it right there. The purpose for why. I tell people for why we're here in general is, is to receive heaven on earth. And I explain what that is because it's, it's, you know, for people, some people, they still have the sense of, well, it's chariots and angels and all these things that are coming out from the sky and all sorts of beautiful pictures of what it could be for them. The way it's been shown to me is the way that I've been describing it all along. It's this, it's this ability to experience what we had when we experience the NDE experience, but instead of having to die physically for it, we're now being able to do it here in this world, but you have to be awoken consciously enough to receive that kind of information, because if you're not, it won't come through. And that's why they're all the references. And again, this isn't just Christian references. This is all over the world in various other traditions and other religions is that everything that we're talking about here that's heaven on earth is here inside us. It's an inward process that taps into the outwardness of what we want to experience. It's not the outward process. And everybody refers to that. And I feel like people are getting that now. I mean, it's a slow process and not the whole world is getting it, but I'm saying that there's enough people now that feel drawn to that message and feel that they came here, not just to experience it for themselves, but hopefully to share that and what I call share their light on the world yeah. once they do. You know, and, and let Democrats be Democrats. Let Republicans be Republicans. Let New Age be New Age. Let Christians be Christians. Let Catholics be Catholics. Let Jews be Jews. Let's trans be trans. Gay to gay. As long as you're not killing anybody. Right. You're not hurting anybody. You're not infringing yourself onto others, making them accept you. No, you just go do you. No. Yeah, you know, um, I, I'll, I'm, I'm going to be even a little bit. If I could just jump on that a little bit, because on um, on on it in the in the supportive way. In that, one of the things that I I remember clearly, and this is I'm sure very clear to a lot of people who've had NDEs. And by the way. In a sense, we've all had NDEs because we've lived many lives. So we've been there and come back here. But for the sake of this particular definition of an NDE, um, when I crossed over and what I experienced, and I've been actually fortunate enough through the, through the clairvoyance that I do, I, I get to go back often. Um, and that's also part of why we're doing this. So we can do this, break the veil, so we can be there all the time, okay? 
But the one thing that I realized is that there is no such thing in that realm of divinity, in that realm of spirituality. There is no such thing uh, as religion. There is no such thing as government. I've been asked this before. Is there a hierarchy of sense of rulership? And I said, there is a sense of evolution there. There's a sense of of how that works within the grand scheme of everything. But th but there is no hierarchy the way that we define it as as humans. Um, it's just a whole different world of consciousness up you know in that area that does just our primitive little minds right now are just trying to expand that out. But anyway, there's no, there's no, none of that. There is no gender. There's no gender. We are, we are, we have an essence of, of, of masculinity and femininity. Remember I told you that when I went into that light, there was no real physical characteristics of these silhouettes. I, I could sense but the femininity. Like, like I heard female voice and then I heard a male voice. You yes. Know? Because there is that sense of femininity and, and, and masculinity, but it's all wrapped into the same essence which is kind of like the yin and the yang and, and the way that other spiritual groups will talk about it. There is no division of that. And that's one of the reasons why this change is happening in, in this physical world. Yeah, right. But, and, and, and that said, I just feel like I just want to say that there's, you know, people that watch this, I don't want to hear about reincarnation. And there's other people like you must believe in reincarnation. Or I don't want to hear about meditation. You must meditate. Do you know what I mean? So then. Yeah. Here we yeah. Go, you like, know, that's what that's that. Peggy that's 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 free will that's free will you know that's the true definition of free will choose yeah. whatever you want to choose as long as as you pointed out you can get to that place of being fully aware of who you are so that you can spread love instead of fear mm -hmm. you know to, to be able yeah, if they if they want to go to church have fun if they want to go meditate have fun if they want to go here and be atheist have fun you know, <laughs> exactly. just don't insist exactly. that everybody see the world through your lens. Exactly. Um, it, it's, it's, it's again, free will. And the beauty of what happens in the spiritual world is that that freedom is there everywhere. There is just, there's no, there's, how do I put it? There's just no, there's just no concept of judgment. Okay. There just isn't. Everything is. Everything just simply is, and it's all beautiful, and it's all divine, yeah. and it's all part of a yeah. tremendous. We're all just going to have to lighten up. Yeah, exactly. Light with the word emphasis on light. Yeah, how? Yeah. No, no, no pun lighten intended. Up. No pun intended, but you got to lighten. It's okay. Up. Get rid yeah. of the hate. Get rid of the fear. Get yeah. rid of the division. I mean, just relax, y'all. <laughs> Yep. I'm a it's, hit. You know, I talk the way I talk. <laughs> I love it. I love I love it. Um, no, I think you hit it beautifully and you used the pun. No, you know, you gotta lighten up because that is what we are. I mean, when I I I have yet to run into anybody that hasn't hasn't expressed this in some way, shape, or form when we leave our bodies um and we go into these realms of spirituality, um there is one acknowledgement you have it may not hit you right away you may go through a process whatever that process is some people call it you know decompression or you go into this room where you get where you look at your life all the, whatever you want to call it once you get through all of that you you get reunited with with oneness and and what i told you when i was reunited with oneness any aspect of what i remembered myself to be as physical is gone I mean, I remember myself as as an aspect of that individual life, but the physicality of it is gone. You are light. You are light. You will always be light. Yeah. But for now, we're also these bodies. We're this blood and guts thinking through a brain. <laughs> yeah, we have a soul. I was listening to something this morning as these scientists talking about the subconscious, and they're saying it's a lower level. And I'm thinking, uh-uh, buddy, I think it's the highest level. I think it actually, our subconscious is the high. I don't think there's no low level. They're talking about, and that's, you know, that's like you, know, you get subliminal messages, you know, you don't even hear them. And then, you know, you get on this um, automatic mode when you're driving. And and this, and I'm like, they're they're putting it down like it's a basic, minimal, you know, like, I don't know. I think it's the whole. See, see, um, there's <laughs> a, 
there this other aspect which i've been kind of alluding to a little bit the school the the what i would also define as the simulation you hear these terms from other guests and other people that you've seen the the general the gist of all that is that we're experiencing contrast um that we are experiencing what we are not as spiritual beings as, as spiritual beings we don't have that ability to to tap into a, a world that sees us as something that we are not we're not hate we're not fear we're not any of that stuff so we experience that and in that world of contrast w- to make it more challenging for us to remember who we are again this is if you if you Allow yourself to just view this as a game for a moment or a school, okay? In school, you 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 learn. In that case, you learn. But you, the things that you do, you have to eventually apply them, at least in theory. You're supposed to apply these things that you learn, right? So when you're in in this particular game, the, the idea is how how well can you remember your divinity within the context of this world of contrast and we're going to make it really difficult because that's how it was designed and you were part of the design team you said let's bring it on let's make it difficult i want to to learn how to remember who i am so all the things that we have that we view um that are insignificant such as in this case i'm going to draw the now you're going to draw the connection to what you just said the subconscious mind Let's call the subconscious mind sort of the inferior piece so that therefore it adds very little value for you to go in within yourself to remember the subconscious part of yourself. Oh, but by the way, in case you do feel like you want to give it some value, let's call that the ego. So that that way the ego, that ego is not necessarily a good thing. So you really, really are fighting the ego. So we put ourselves in this state of mind where all the clues and this is what i always tell people you have to look at everything that makes sense in your mind in your heart and look at them from a different perspective like you just did is it really the subconscious mind that's inferior or is it really the subconscious mind that is the gateway to everything that you are because if you start to ask yourself those questions and they make sense you always follow what makes sense and you will find the truth the game, the school is, is is designed to make it challenging for you so that if you can get through there, like all the great masters have, like Yeshua did, you know, and others, you have mastered. That's why they're called masters. You have mastered the school. And that's where we're at. That's what we're being asked to do now. It's like you've gotten all of the tutorials. You have gone through all the schooling. You have gone through every experience imaginable that you could possibly possibly have so now it's time for you to experience it as something different be the divinity and see yourself through the contrast i'm getting a visual of a tornado the tornado comes and it blows your house to bits it's just all confetti and you're standing there like oh crap (laughs) but you're still standing there yeah exactly i you know so interesting it's you're, interesting you're just, because you're dead. It's, it's all gone, but you're still there. You're still there. You will always be there. And 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 the tornado was there, and now it's not. So it's now not part of your reality anymore. But you are always there, and that's what they're. That is what we are trying to remember. And I think if like you know we were talking about identity crisis, it's kind of like that. It's like we had these tornadoes, one after the other. And it stripped us of our ego and our maybe our career, maybe our family, maybe everything. And, and you know, people, I think of like people lost everything in Wall Street or something. And they put a gun to their head because they, they just, they can't go and say, huh, well, what do I do now? Because right. I'm still here. I'm right. going to rebuild. Where do I rebuild? What was that? You know, and... And then when we have these NDEs and these flashbacks, these um, spiritual experiences, it's kind of like that too. Like everything has just been torn up. Everything we thought, everything we were trying to do. And now we're faced with these truths about ourselves and our memories. And and where do we go with that now? 
Exactly. And that's the message. That's the broader message that, that we're trying to bring back. Um, and, and again, I've had conversations with groups of end years where I explain it the way you just did. And they, they themselves go, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, I remember this one gentleman in particular said, I've been, this is part of my NDE experience, but I've never shared it with anybody because quite honestly, I couldn't really put it into words. I couldn't, I couldn't quite grasp it myself. So I kind of just left it alone because I could easily explain what happened to me, but I couldn't quite capture how that, what that meant coming back. And he said, thank you, you know, because he wanted to express that to the world as well, because everything, this gets back, even connecting it back to what you just said about what that person said about the subconscious, everything, everything has to do with the inwardness of what, of who you are. It, it has less to do with the outwardness because what happens is if you can figure this out, if you can figure this out, everything will fall into place. Everything. I'm not saying some things, everything. If you continue to try to sort it out in terms of the chaos out here, whether it's a tornado that blew through or whether it's just your life is one big tornado, you won't figure it out. It just won't. You will continue to chase your tail. And, and I think it. another way of visual looking at it is, you know, as a young woman, I would look in the mirror. I was thin and I was young and, um, oh, my hair looks great. Oh, my face looks great. Oh, my figure looks great in this. That's what I saw in the mirror. Yeah. And then something traumatic happened and you look right in the mirror and look in your eyes. Who are you? I oh, can't see funny. you. I can't There's find a you. That's a, that's so How interesting. How are yeah. you? You're hurt. What are you going to do now? You got to get off this path and this path. I mean, just look yourself in the mirror. Yourself, not your looks, not your body, but see your soul in there and have a conversation. To me, that would be the best meditation. You know what's interesting you said is because one of the first things that I do with my students is we, we everything for us in the way of the inner child is a very intensively immersive experience but it's all playfulness uh, it, it's taking all the simplicity and taking all the complexity and making it simple again so one of the first games that we play and it's usually not one that we play together it's usually a homework assignment that i give them is to do the mirror game and and we do the mirror game in to the extent the way that you're talking about it where you really are having this intimate conversation with your soul and so it's interesting that you mentioned that because that is one of the first things that we do right away to introduce yourself to yourself to yourself to the higher aspect of who you are and and it's usually quite astonishing how people who have always looked at themselves in the mirror you know in the morning whatever have enormous appreciation for what they see when they get really intimate with that image that's popping out on the other side. So yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. Well, this has been really interesting. We've been all over the place, but that's the way I like it. <laughs> it has been, it has been. There isn't a, you know, it's fun when, with these kind of conversations, we just go wherever spirit takes us, we just yeah. go, you know, there's something, yeah. there's a nugget in everything. And, um, and somebody out there needed that nugget. So they I've just, had professional speakers say, now, um, do you want to ask me this, this and this and this? And what do you want to do? Like, I just let it roll. I just let yeah, it, me too. Yeah, me, where, me too. Us to go? <laughs> people will say, you know, exactly. People will say, so tell me, you know, give me a list of questions I should ask and go, why don't we just wing it? Yeah. You know, because inevitably we don't stay to those questions and we go off into places that we're meant to be gone to you know and, yeah. and we always wind up ending like we're doing here and going wow <laughs> that, this was pretty cool i yeah. like that yeah it's like playtime you know it is it's exactly like to be that kid again and getting that imagination not but we're looking for the truth it's not like we're making up stuff it's like we're yes. playing with the truth and digging yep. around trying to find more truth and see what yep. your truth is does that match with my truth maybe i'm a little different here maybe a little question you know it's just like this exactly I love it. Everybody has a beautiful piece of the puzzle. Everybody is important. And that's the thing I always tell people. It's like, 
if you're, I always tell people that yeah, towards the end of these kind of discussions, you know, why, why are you listening to this? Because you are drawn to this discussion because you are a very vital piece to this whole thing. This picture couldn't be complete without you. You're doing this for a reason. You may sometimes think you're just doing this to listen to some good conversation about metaphysical stuff of called the near death experience. But you're doing it because you're trying to remember because you are, I, I tell people, you are perfect and your perfection is needed right now. And yeah. people get it. People get that. And we get in these roles, you know, of our jobs and of our relationships. And then, you know, we're not, we're just thinking with that brain. We're not thinking with our soul. And that's what I hope, like you're saying, that we get to do is like, Let's have these conversations where you just open up. You're not talking about work. You're not talking about the new car you're going to get or, you know, what you're going to buy or all those stupid things. Well, and that, and, <laughs> and that's why I, it's very, 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 very rare that we would have conversations, whether I'd be having them with you or you're having them with somebody else. It's very, very, very rare that we ever get into things like manifestation, although manifestation is part of the reason we're here. It's very rare that we talk about that. I certainly don't because, because manifestation is sort of after you have discovered who you are. It has to be. If you don't know who you really are inwardly, spiritually, however you want to define it that makes sense to you, it's difficult for you to use the beauty of the of the of this sort of divine energy that's all around you to to actually create anything of of significance that will make you happy, really happy. Right. Um, right. If it's you're always finding your core, which is your strength. Oh, you because, bet it's your strength. You know, if, if you lose your job tomorrow, you lose your house, your your marriage, or whatever. If you don't have that core strength. When you're standing there after the tornado, like, huh, when that's funny, what am I going to do now? You know, you know what I mean? That I do know what up. you mean. Um, we don't want this. We don't, I, I just don't want people, I mean, people do what they want, but I just hope that some people will find their inner strength. The, so when times of trouble, you'll have some core of yourself, knowing who you are, what you believe. You know, they said it was a country song. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. I think it's Aaron Tippin. I and, love that. We don't stand yeah. for something. If you could stand for yourself, I really, I, I'm just going to add that little piece in. If you can stand for yourself. Yes. Know who you are. Know who you first, are. And then stand up for yourself. Yeah. Then nothing. And this is what, then nothing that might come about could ever affect you the way it would have done before. In other words, what I, I will tell you that I have seen in my life and I have seen it in people that I have worked and helped with that when they come to know who they are, the reality, the reality of their manifestations become a thing of joy to them. It doesn't necessarily have to translate in cars and money. It, it does create for them whatever security they want, but they're happy. They're, they're genuinely happy again. And and the things that would you know all the trials and tribulations that they that they have weaved their way through, literally, and I don't exaggerate, literally disappear, because life starts to mirror your happiness, not your fear, and that's why it's so critical that we take time to stop ourselves from all of this reaction that we have to the world, go into ourselves to find who we are. Because if we do that, I, I, this is a big word, but I promise people that if you do that, you will find happiness again. You will find clarity. You will find the purpose for why you're here. But if you're trying to do it out here and yeah, never I find think, out, and never find out teach, who you are. Right. And I think they should teach this in schools. Find out okay. who you are because Could you're you not going to go have sex with that boy because he's putting pressure on you. You're not going to do those dread, drugs because your friends are putting pressure on you. You're not going to do go steal something because you're going to know in your core who you are and what you stand for. And you're going to walk the walk. Yeah. You're not going to talk the talk. You're going to walk the walk. Yeah. I think and it's really important at every age. I, well, you bet. 
the the younger the better because it's at the young ages where you forget who you are at the very very young ages you do have a semblance of something that you were connected to but as you get older and i'm not talking that old into your teenage years and stuff you you completely forget i you know we call that thing other things i call it falling back asleep again and if we could teach that you know i actually will go even further there's this there's a whole thing about empathy that we don't understand that the power of empathy we haven't really even really had a real discussion about it other than now it's becoming sort of a, a nice kind of sexy term to use when you're when you're emotionally insensitive emotionally oversensitive but it to 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 me and the way that i've been shown it it's it's a very powerful extra sensory ability a sixth sense that was given to us to help us cope with this world and we live uh, in a society where people can see somebody dying on the street and just keep walking yes and if we if we learn the beauty of that skill of empathy and understand how empathy even plays itself out when we are still in our mother's womb um absorbing the pain of the world um, as our way of processing who we are before we come out. If we could do all that, if we could understand all that, we could put this in in all clinics to show people what how to be sensitive to that whole process that we have uh, of who we become later on as as Don't human. Don't become normal. Don't become <laughs> normal. Normal. I think of robots. We're all going in the same way. We look the same. We dress the same. We talk the same. Don't be normal. Stop yeah. trying to be normal. Stop trying to fit in. And, and, and I want to get that square peg in that round hole. <laughs> and I, I, I really want to be clear that what I'm discussing has has less to do with whatever social conditioning or social rules of whatever kind. Okay, I don't see, I don't experience. I, I experienced my life the way I experienced it when I was on on the other side, which is to say. That there are no labels for me. They don't. They don't exist for me. Uh, and so when I discuss when I discuss this kind of stuff with with people, I want them to see it from a, just a pure, just pure sort of spiritual, just whatever you want to call spiritual, but just from a pureness of it, how we assimilate ourselves into this world and why we should be sensitive to that. That's you know, without getting into what type of belief system this falls into because again i don't have that sense of how this world is in this this world puts us into categories puts us into labels puts us into right or wrong and and that was all well designed in the game i don't see that anymore that's for me how i exist in this world but not of it and some people might go, well, you're being really naive and go, no, actually, I'm not. I'm actually fully aware of how this all works. And if we all were fully aware of how this all works, this world could change overnight. And it actually will. And the stuff that I've actually seen in the, in the visions and prophecies that I write about in the book and in my second book, um, they're all on a certain we're all on a certain timeline for all this to change. So we will see this uh, mm -hmm. so that we don't have to die. So that we yeah, physically that, die. A lot of people yeah. scared, you know, because of COVID and then the restrictions and, you know, war and the, everybody's just like, what's next? So much weirdness happened that we thought and, could and, never and, happen. And now we're sitting down. See, see, to me, to me, those experiences are global macro experiences of an STE. It forces us to start to question ourselves in a way that we never were given the chance or gave ourselves a chance to do it to me that's just they in the book it's called a defining moment the the collective that i speak to talks about it as a defining moment but you know you can call it whatever you want to call it but it gives it it gives you that moment to stop and and ask yourself there's got to be something more to all of this that all of this craziness looks like craziness and if you you know, if you look at the way, if you look at it from the way that history plays itself out, there's always chaos before the calm. And this chaos isn't a chaos to scare us. It's it, it's a chaos to help us remember who we are. And through that process of remembering, 
we will we will come into a world that is dramatically dramatically beautiful and peaceful and loving and people go oh franco you you have such a different way of looking at well part of it is okay i'm cheating i get to see the i get to see a vision of the world that's coming and if i could just if i can spew out in the best way I can with words, what is coming, what is actually here already and is actually ready to be unwrapped. Um, yeah. People would start to change their, their narrative right away because it's a, it's enormously beautiful. Enormous. Yeah, the people that all got together and thought, Oh, that looks like a good idea. They see it on the news. This go out and riot and burn down businesses and fight the police and do all this craziness. Well, guess what? How about, we, the rest of us go over here and have a street party and we dance, we have a picnic, we have a good old time. You fools go over there and I hope nobody joins your party. I hope they all come you know, you know, that that is what we need more is that awareness that what we need to do, and this is what people desire. They do desire this. I mean, I'm not saying everybody, okay, but there is this desire for that type of an approach. And we don't necessarily know how to express that yet to ourselves, much less to each other. But that day is coming. And it's, as I tell people, it's not like 100 years from now. It's not even 10 years from now. All the perfect storm, if you will, and I'm going to use that very, turn very carefully, that per, the perfect storm, the perfect alignment to everything that needs to happen in the way that so many have talked about for thousands of years is right now. And and that's the one thing that I know I came back from my near-death experience, and that was a message that I was told to tell humanity, that it is about right now. And that the one... What's that? We're at crossroads. Yes, we are absolutely. Uh, and I wouldn't even... There's a different part. I, I would get into the... But this would take at least another half hour. So there is this thing about the crossroads, which does make sense. But but where we're at right now really is the opportunity. I call it an opportunity. Mm -hmm. The opportunity to really blow this thing open in a good way, in, an, in the heaven on earth And way. it's not going to be you win or I win. Who wins way? No, it won't be. Everybody. It's, it's going to be. I'm going to let you go there and just do what you want to do. I'm going to leave It's going to be a glorious, it's going to be a glorious opportunity, a celebration of our, of our divinity and our diversity. And that's happening now. I always tell people this, and this is the way it was told to me. So take it or leave it. It's really up to you. Free will. But the way that I was shown was that we have spent thousands of years, thousands, even before Yeshua, waiting for something, okay, to come, someone to come and part the part the skies and all of that. When in actuality, we have been waiting for ourselves. We've been waiting for ourselves to see the divinity in ourselves. And that will give us the spiritual consciousness that Yeshua was talking about and others, by the way. And then we will see heaven on earth and experience it. We've always been waiting for ourselves. And that's the irony of all ironies is that we keep waiting, looking for something out there to happen when it's kind of like I always tell people, we're like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. We go and go through this odyssey of experiences to try to find the man behind the curtain because the man behind the curtain get ho Dorothy back home again. When at the end, you got to do is click her heels. <laughs> that's right. That's right. At the end, Dorothy was told, Dorothy, you've always had the ability to go home. You've always been waiting literally for yourself to do it. And then see, I find that to be so amusing because the world is riddled with these types of messages. We've always had the ability to do this. And now the it's the lion time. always had the courage, you know. Yes. The tin man we, always had the heart. And what, we or just, what is it, the strong guy, whatever. You yeah, know? They exactly. Had it within themselves all along. All along. And oh, if you really, really, if you really, really, really dig deep within the, the message of all of these sacred documents. And I don't care what religion or what spiritual tradition. It doesn't matter. They're always the same. They all speak to this. They all speak to who we really are as divinity. And the idea now is that we have to remember that, em embrace it, have complete faith in it, and away we go. And that's where we're at, Peggy. We're at that point right now. Yeah, and I think we all can, in our own way, push things in that direction. 
you, that's why we're here. That's again, why we have been waiting for ourselves. We are the only ones that can push it. We have to, we have to push it because we have to raise our own consciousness, our own frequency to achieve the frequency that is called heaven on earth. Yeah. If, it's not the, that's just a law. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's hurting somebody else. So no, you it, win. Yeah, no, it, 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 it has. Away, say, it, whatever. <laughs> it has. And, and, and I do want to say that, you know, I want this to, you know, there are different ways of saying what I just said in different languages and in different traditions. And I want people to understand that it's the concept of what we're talking about. There is this thing called the law of resonance, which is actually something that supersedes the law of attraction, but we don't talk about the law of resonance. And the law of resonance states, and it's a universal law, okay? And that is that you cannot attract anything, anything that you desire unless you are vibrating at that level already. You know, you cannot, let's just really dummy it down to like, you know, the riches that people desire. You cannot experience that richness unless you know how to experience it already vibrationally in your heart. If you do that, then the law of physics, which also supports the law of resonance, which is law of resonance is a spiritual term, will support that belief system. In other words, it supports it from the standpoint it says, yeah, that's exactly how it works. It's exactly how it works. You have in music, you cannot have two forks, tuning forks, vibrate if they're not on the same resonance. I mean, all of these things are just natural occurrences. But we have to, as spiritual beings, we 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 have to push this, and we have to push ourselves to a point where we can vibrate. I started I started this whole discussion with vibration because it is we have to vibrate at that level of consciousness. So we can receive heaven on earth. People, people always think. And another term for heaven on earth, by the way, is fifth dimensional reality. It's the divine feminine. There's so many names for it, but the the, the gist of it is, we can, we people assume that this is just going to land on us, and voila, everything is going to change. And I keep telling people, you have to show that you are ready to receive that by vibrating at a higher level. You have to be the magnet that draws that energy in. Therefore, the only one that you've been ever waiting for is yourself. And people get that and they go, all right, sh wait, I'm in. Tell me, how do we do this? Because it makes sense to them in a world that doesn't make sense with everything else. All right. Well, thank you for your time. And it's been very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm sure it give people a lot to chew on. So, you know, it's, yeah, I appreciate you giving giving me the time to, to share a lot of stuff I don't normally share. It's in the book, but it, and, and I talk about it with my students, but usually people want to just talk about the NDE and some of the things that came out of it, but there was a lot of substance here that helped, hopefully will help some people. Bug. But Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some substance and some, and some distractions that will help people do, to, uh, to make sense of it if, in their lives. And that's that's all we can hope for. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.